Mr. Chairman, um, Ms. Woodcock, and thank you to our panel for being here today. Um, you know, I, I do have questions about the um, the sunscreen, but I, I think that we've we've gone over that um, pretty well here in committee. And um, you know, as a nurse prior to coming to Congress, obviously this is an issue that we're all very concerned about with skin cancer. And I guess what I would like to hear from you is, please, can you just tell our committee that that you are committed to improving upon this issue? I mean, obviously the time has been too long. It has been too long, as I said uh, a number of months ago when I appeared before this committee. I think I'm almost as frustrated as the manufacturers and some of you all about this issue. So I do commit to improving it. We have already taken steps to speed up this process and move it along. Okay. Um, moving along to um, some of the issues uh, in having to do with ensuring patient access and effective drug enforcement act of 2013. You know, there again, a very important issue. Um, we, this is one that I think many of us, you know, we understand uh, the drug abuse issue. We understand the deaths that have occurred um, as a result. And, you know, we need to be proactive on this issue. Um, you know, one of the solutions that's been put forward um, that holds promise is the development of abuse resistant prescription drug products. Such formulations make it harder for individuals to break down prescription drugs for abuse purposes. You know, obviously that would be the actual um, drug itself. And I would just like to thank you uh, for the work that you've been doing. And I do want a clarification. My understanding is that, um, that there is some progress being made right now uh, that the agency is doing, contracting with some of the academic and research institutions, utilizing research grant funding through the Generic Drug User Fee Act um, to study this evaluation of, of abuse deterrent formulations. Is this correct? I can't comment on the funding, but what the research is correct, yes. And we are trying to develop a framework so that uh, as uh, we don't want to approve abuse deterrent formulations that then disincentivize people from um, pr uh, developing better ones. We have approved one, and it has some abuse deterrent properties. However, we need to get much better than that. So what we need to do is kind of establish both the, uh, you know, the carrot and the stick incentives, and we're doing research in our own laboratories as well as elsewhere. Will the FDA and its guidance uh, provide flexibility and encourage manufacturers to pursue alternative methods and approaches to develop meaningful abuse deterrent technologies rather than a single development path such that the innovation and advancement in science are effective harness? I mean, is, are there incentives that are being put forward? Absolutely, that's part of, a, uh, of the strategy, is to have multiple different uh, abuse deterrent mechanisms mm -hmm. so that if one might be overcome, uh, Mr. Ranazizi and I were talking earlier, the criminals are always sort of one step sure. ahead of you. Sure. And so we need to keep encouraging that innovation. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Woodcock. And Mr. Um, Ranazizi, um, you know, there again, I, I think we've, there's a lot of discussion of clarity and process um, on, on how things are moving forward. You know, we, we're hearing repeatedly uh, that uh, registrants are very concerned about the lack of clarity. However, you have outlined um, that this is something that, that, that the DEA is working on and, and um, you say that, that you, and I, I'm going to quote you, that you give the opportunity for the registrants to come forward. You, um, that um, there's, there's plenty of opportunity for them. Is there a process for appeal of a decision by the DEA? And can you describe that if, if, if a registrant is, is found to have had their, um, been revoked, uh, their, uh, their um, DEA um, ability to produce uh, suspended or revoked? I believe they could take it to district court. You, you believe yeah, or you? I, I think you take it to the district court. Okay. Um, when, when we're talking about the hearing process, um, I know uh, my colleague across the aisle, we, um, Mr. Green was 
was referring to some of the hearing procedures, and there seems to be a lot of discrepancy on timing of how long a hearing would take. Can you tell us what the average um, time is? I know uh, my colleague had, had said that, that he had heard a, a time frame, um, and, and there again, I don't know exactly the number, but you, you basically said you weren't sure where that number came from. Can you tell us? I don't, I don't believe that was for a hearing. I believe that was for, uh, I think that was for scheduling, the time frame it takes t for scheduling action. For to a schedule? Yeah, okay. for a hearing, uh, again, it depends on if it's an immediate suspension order with an order to show cause or just a plain ordinary. So to, to that point, how long would you say that it does take a hearing to be scheduled? And then I know my time is. In order to show, when we do an immediate suspension order with an order to show cause, the date of the hearing is on the order to show cause, and I believe it's within 30 days. Okay, the, within 30 days. Thank you now, so much. Yeah. Uh, my uh, uh, my time has expired. Chair, thank you.